So after this beautiful film, Saltwater Dreams, um, we're going to have a conversation in between uh, Elizabeth and uh, Vivian Zier, a long-term collaborator of uh, uh, Elizabeth, uh, curator of, uh, director of Frontier Imaginaire here in the Netherlands, uh, an amazing project that is unfolding in these uh, recent uh, times. And uh, they know each other for a long time, and actually the first time I met Karabing was thanks to Vivian. So I'm glad that to bring them together to have a conversation around uh, what you've seen and of course uh, to have a conversation with you all uh, afterwards. So please, the floor is yours. The mandatory sip of water. <laughs> uh, thanks, Matteo. And um, as you've introduced, it's a beautiful and a special moment to be here uh, personally. So I'm the uh, initiator and director of Frontier Imaginaries. Um, and over the past four or five years, that project's been unfolding and it's kind of been going alongside an incredible process by which Carter Bing Film Collective have started to make movies, and then not only that, have had them shown first of all in Melbourne and Brisbane, but then increasingly uh, and, and really uh, incredibly overseas in, in extremely uh, renowned venues such as the Berlin Ali. Uh, the forthcoming travel is to Eflux in New York, uh, and then on for a survey at the Tate uh, Film Institute. And certainly from the perspective of Australian art, let's say, that's uh, a completely incredible uh, and sort of enviable achievement. Um, it proposes something of a, of, a, of a paradox in a way, in terms of um, why is it that international audiences respond so strongly to a film practice that at first may appear to be very remote and very localised? Um, and my uh, proposal or, or response is that what Karabing's film discloses is not some kind of an ancient indigenous wisdom by which modernity can save itself or some kind of otherness, but what the film helps international audiences to grasp is the impossibility of their own worlds and the impossibility of their own conditions of economic, social and political dwelling within the global condition. So the aesthetic achievement of Carter Bing is a capacity to cut the that there of the ethnographic gaze with the this here of the global condition. So along with that, there's a bunch of uh, questions around, um, let's say, the temporal politics of the film uh, production, of Carter Bing's film production. And that's uh, where I'd like to start, or how I'd like to frame the conversation that we'll be having in terms of the temporal politics of what is produced in Carter Bing's film and the bigger question that Bach have given us in terms of how to um, find ways of navigating an increasingly uh, uh, fascistically inflected uh, social and political uh, international system. Um, so something, of course, about... Um, a fascist uh, temporality is, is, a, is a strong... <laughs> <laughs> She's leaving the stage. <laughs> Sorry. Is a sense of event and spectacle. <laughs> mm. And so with that uh, put forward in front of us to work through, I wanted to start by asking about this term improvisational realism, which is the term that you guys have given to your filmmaking, both as a practice and as an aesthetic. Uh, and so I'd like you to introduce what is meant by this improvisational realism and perhaps some instances of where we see it or yeah. witness it within yeah. Wuttar, the film that we've just seen. Yeah. Um, now, now I'm futzing. First, you, first you're cold, then you futz. Uh, so improvisational realism um, is also described by members of the collective as uh, testing it out. So, um, uh, w and with the sense that in the world that they inhabit and are made to inhabit, nothing quite works. Right. Um, and nothing quite works stretches from uh, 
something that you see in the film, like the motor doesn't quite work uh, because the motor has to be bought along with the boat, second, third, fourth hand. Um, and it, uh, the backstory of the boat, that actual boat, is that it was bought uh, out of money from the death of one of the members, uh, so compensation money. So you don't see that in the film, but they all know that. Um, but when you see over going into the back of the community where the old church is and pulling out a wire and looking at it and says, well, this will work, um, it, it's, it's one of the just really small in the background moments in which they're showing what they mean by improvisational realism or testing it out. That is, how do you find bits and scraps in the world that's been given to you to make your world continue to go. Um, so that, that it's in the films, uh, but it's also the manner in which uh, the films are made. Uh, so the pr production process, mm -hmm. yeah, production process. I mean, it's really interesting because we, it was, I don't know when it was, nobody, we can't really remember. Sometimes we think it's 2009, 2010, mm -hmm. when um, one of the members, I remember it was Jojo, Linda, the one that, you know, trust in the Lord. Um, she, uh, others remember it's Trevor, because he always wanted to be a movie star. But in any case, somebody said, let's, let's start making films, uh, because uh, uh, the, the, the manner in which mm. indigenous people actually have to make their way through the world is not on film. You, you see the heroic, or you mm. see the damage, but you don't mm. see survivance. You don't see... You know, it, nothing quite works, but we continue to go anyways. Mm. Um, so in the first two films we, we used, um, and no, nobody in the group, including me, knew how to make, we weren't filmmakers. So we, uh, uh, they said, you know, find somebody that you know in New York and bring them back and we'll look at that person, see whether we like that person. So we did. There was a filmmaker who kind of taught us basic craft. The first two films we used a very small um, production uh, crew, so a cinematographer and a sound person. Um, but they were working on industry time, so it's like a week and get up in the morning at six and shoot till noon and then take a break and then shoot. And that, that does not fit the improvisational nature mm. of um, Karabing worlds. Mm. I mean, where it, someone might be in jail, someone might have to suddenly go to a welfare office, somebody might have to go to a funeral, someone who's been up all night drunk and doesn't want to get up in the morning, you know, or I want to go for a swim. I mean, it just doesn't fit how we, how the world, the temporality of the world they're in. So we all decided that it was making them and us something we didn't want to be. So starting with this film, we decided to just shoot on, shoot ourselves on uh, iPhones whenever, you know, we throw it in the back of the car and it's like we're somewhere, oh wait, isn't that scene supposed to be shot here? And we shoot it there and hope to God people have the right clothes or haircut or whatever. And if they don't, well, whatever. Mm. So... So the production process mm. was, the demand was, why should our world need to conform to a production model? Mm -hmm. Why don't we see if we can improvise all the way into filmic logics as well? Because mm. yeah. as I understand it, this mode of production is also very pragmatically a mode of production of survivance. Yeah. You know? yeah. On the one hand, that it's opened up sources of income, and in the film, when there's the fine of $30,000, that's $30,000 on people who get $250 a fortnight. And that's the one source of And you get coin, fined right? $180 if you have an open can of beer. Yeah. So, so uh, Gavin's brother, Gavin owes right now, I said, how much you owe? He said, oh, Auntie, I owe, like right now I owe $800. And then Kelvin, his brother said, I, owned, I owe 7000 any day now I'm going to go to jail. Because you see, I mean, in black and brown indigenous communities worldwide, you see a very similar neoliberal strategy, which is a return to the imprisonment of the poor. And since the poor are brown and black and indigenous, in many of these contexts, far more than any other demographic, 
then it's a new way of imprisonment. And so mm. that that section of the film, there was a, these are based on things that have actually happened to everybody. And there was, I think it was $20,000. I think we made it 30000 but it was $20,000 for not having safety equipment. Yep. And at the time, I think Sunto owed $1,000 in fines so for little uh, quality of life infractions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So again, quality of life infractions, the scale of what is a political event, what is right. an announceable right. political event kind of is part of it. And right. so at that point, it's perhaps interesting to scale out and to also talk to you as a minute as uh, Elizabeth A. Povinelli, the, the <laughs> scholar who publishes stuff as Jack well. Jack the racist. Oh, I want to... <laughs> that, I'll tell you what actually... That, the, yeah, well, anyways, yes, yeah, I'll okay. be Elizabeth now. Okay, now. you're Elizabeth A. I'll Povinelli, Elizabeth the much sought after uh, mm. uh, scholar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because something about this temporal politics is a belatedness within the global condition because this... Renewal that you say of the imprisonment of the poor yeah. was a new set of policies that were experimented upon indigenous right. populations in the Northern Territory from 2007 mm -hmm. with a new set of rhetorics around workfare right. that formed the policy prototypes that became UK austerity policy. So there's a way in which right. there's a folding, the, the, the things that are arriving to the shores of Europe at the moment right are in fact belated, right? Right, right? And this can be understood to a certain extent within the greater frame that you've been theorizing in terms of late liberalism. Mm. And I wonder if you could open that up to the audience here. Absolutely. But now I'm going to qualify Elizabeth A. Povinelli <laughs> <laughs> by, um, and I, I've said this before, uh, but I, I, th I do think it bears repeating because it comes back to the question of obligation um, and the impossibility of ever solving obligation, which is important. Um, Elizabeth A. Povinelli is, an, is a belated effect of right. the folks that you see in the film's parents and grandparents. Um, so when I first met, I first met the adults in this film when they were seven or eight, and I was a philosopher and, uh, and for a lot of reasons, not the least of which um, my epidermal makeup in the U.S., there's more investment. I go to college I, in philosophy. Uh, there, then there are, uh, talk about infrastructures, then there are networks that take you there and can take you somewhere else. So I w uh, went to Australia on a fellowship and um, first met their parents and grandparents and they asked me to write uh, grants for a child mesh, uh, crash program. Uh, we can go into it, doesn't matter. Point being, at the end of the year, um, when I was going back to the U.S. after this fellowship, uh, th their, th the adults here asked, they were involved in a very large land claim over the lands in which this film is, is set. It was very... Um, it was a very divided uh, land claim. Um, and by law, indigenous people must be represented by a lawyer and an anthropologist. So the anthropologist has to certify their cultural authenticity mm -hmm. by law. And a lawyer has to make the legal claim on their behalf. Right? So they can't stand up and, and, and present themselves. And so their parents said, you know, why don't you, I was, I was born in the woods, uh, you know, it's a very comfortable place for me. And they said, why don't you come back and be our lawyer? And I, I said, no, I spent my entire life not being a lawyer. And they said, well, what about anthropologists? And I said, I don't know what that is. And they said, you, you don't seem that stupid. Why, why don't you go figure it out, Right. So Elizabeth A. Povinelli, and, Eliz and there, there's many, you know, it's, I'm also myself, but, but Elizabeth A. Povinelli is an epiphenomena, belated phenomena of, of these kinds of uh, uh, this, this space in which they are. And so Elizabeth A. Povinelli's thinking about late liberalism is a thought that emerges out of a very specific context, a very specific kind of problematic that then the films show not because they exemplify my thinking, but, mm. but my thinking is emerging from a place with them. And 
so, so yeah, so, so what the films are showing and what my, my kind of professorial writing um, uh, has been talking about is indeed the ongoing way in which certain, of course, uh, places and populations are uh, 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 places of experimentation for late liberal or, you know, the, that combination of liberal tactics of recognition, which we should talk about, and uh, capital tactics of, of pulling value mm. out of certain spaces so that it can be redistributed to other mm. spaces. Mm. And the way in uh, which um, th that's always tested out on, on the poor, the brown, uh, and et cetera. Mm -hmm. Certainly one of the things that I've learned over the past few years working with you and working with Katabing and trying to study and understand the frontier is coming to understand that the frontier is first and foremost a, a means of continuing to maintain appropriate distance where actual geographical distance has been logistically collapsed. Right. So where manganese from your guys' uh, right. ancestral creek right. can pop up in my laptop, right. your guys' stories and people and lives doesn't. Right. Do you know what I mean? Right. So there's a means of maintaining distance that occurs through production of difference, right? right. Production right. of cultural difference, production of temporal difference, production of gender difference as well. Um, so that's, yeah, it's uh, clear through the films. I'm interested to go back to um, what you'd mentioned when you first came up in terms of um, elaborating on what the otherwise is vis-a-vis -vis right. another space to what is the self and the other, right? Right. right. Um, and it'd be interesting if you could do that in terms of talking about what Karabing is as an artist, because the moment you bring Karabing mm. uh, to an art center, usually the artist is highly individuated as an author, mm. right? Mm. And when you're standing here, as you've said, there's about 30 people who are standing around you right. all the time. Right, right. Um, uh, so s s the, f at least f f for me um, and also for us, uh, there's a, there's, one has to carefully distinguish between what we mean by the otherwise and what we mean by the dialectic of the self and the other. Um, this, this, the self and the other are in at least state politics, let's start there, um, but also in public imaginary and, uh, and liberal uh, spaces, uh, two positions that are fixed and, and, and somewhat variable. So, for instance, in their, in their lives, um, they have been the positive and the negative other to an imagined Australian subject. Uh, they've been the positive, and again, like Jojo, all the adults here, most <laughs> let's say they really began speaking in the mid-70s when Australia decided that it's white only, it's white nationalism, uh, was a problem, and um, they could celebrate themselves uh, it by promoting a form of, of state multiculturalism. Mm -hmm. And it would have two sides. One, it would, it would pivot against a, a long-standing, you know, the Asian peril, uh, the yellow peril uh, position, right? And on the other hand, it could position itself as, as unique, enlightened, like the, the, the enlightened Mm. Uh, uh, white state in the Pacific, Asian Pacific, by embracing um, its indigenous population. Mm. And, and there's a whole set of apologies. Uh, there was the passage of land claim uh, uh, acts in 76, in which suddenly the state said, oh, it, what we are is a set of self-other relationships, and the other is a positive thing. The other is a form of cultural difference that is, it offers something uh, positive to the uh, nation's self-understanding of itself. And 
So the state turned to indigenous people and said, ah, you, you're, you, you have something good to do. You, you tell us how you're human and different from us, but don't be so different that we suddenly feel repulsed again and, and it, it, that is that you abrogate any of our foundational ethics. Mm -hmm. And so what they did is they took the problem, they threw it onto indigenous people and said, be different enough, but not too different, right? And that's the position of the other, right? Is that it's, it's always in relation to what the same is. And initially it was positive, then with the advent of a more aggressive neoliberal state in terms of the in intervention that happened in 2007, um, cultural difference, indigenous cultural difference became bad again, mm. but it was still other to the mm. self. And, and what, the, what, what the otherwise is neither the self nor the other. Mm. It's the other to the other. It's the refusing of being one or the other. And I think in Muthar, what everybody really likes about it is it's, it's one of the films that really puts on the table, look, there's a, everybody has a variety of positions, right? It's like, you know, that first opening scene where, um, you know, Jojo is like, pray to the Lord. Trevor's like, it's the ancestors. Over's like, it's, I don't know about, you know, the Lord, but I know about wiring. You're like, you know, what about mechanics here, science? Um, but even there, like, and right away, Trevor's going, like, it's the ancestors. Hey, I believe in the Lord. And by the time you get to the end, when Jojo's with the ancestors, she's not seeing this as an opposition. She's seeing mm -hmm. this as a set of currents, and that set of currents is what constitutes their life world. And it's neither the mm. same as settler self, nor is it... <laughs> Australian nor, woman. Yeah, <laughs> that's all right. American white woman. Nor is it, nor is it um, the other that the state imagines mm. and celebrates, that is that frozen tradition, mm. that is past perfect, that is untouched, that is, right? Yep. And, and so the Kotterbing films and Kotterbing as a practice is saying, we refuse to be either one of those. Mm. And that's who we are. Yeah. Yeah. So before we welcome some questions to the audience, I think that raises, um, how do you say, almost like a mechanical understanding that, that puts a lot of pressure, I think interesting and perhaps helpful pressure on what it means to hail fascism as a term that's important to think through and, and to respond mm. to, right? Mm. Because um, within this self-other dynamic, the, um, particularly in Australia, right. uh, we, for example, had the phenomenon of right-wing uh, populism right. really, again, in terms of this blatantness, really early on. Pauline Hansen's like, what, 95? 95, 95, yeah. Something like Way this, early, so like yeah. quite, quite prior to its right. emergence in Europe, Howard, actually. you might as well say, um, you guys, this is getting to be like, you know, internal Australian politics, but there was a prime minister, John Howard, who was elected in 91, mm. who um, very much was really turning, he wasn't going to turn Australia back into white nationalism of the pre-70s, but he, he, he absolutely pulled the 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 Europeanness of Australia back in, and he wished to roll back um, indigenous politics um, to prior prior to the seventies. Um, so trying to figure out a way of opening land to mining again, mm. um, doing run around, and and really assaulted the notion of cultural difference as the basis for uh, rights. But he was doing it from the right. Right. But yeah. so, so you have kind of like, you have a 1970s era of right. multicultural liberal recognition, right. right? That doesn't work out well for you guys. It's no. not working, okay? Yeah. Then in the 90s, you kind of have a backlash against that. So there's Howard, but then there's also the advent of right-wing populism, right. and that's like, no, these guys aren't right. others good, they're others bad, right. Right? right? And that's what is so ascendant in Europe and so ascendant right. in the United States, and right. that tends to be what's pointed at as fascist, right? right. And so the problem in, in dialogue with uh, 
Denise De Silva, for example, uh, she had an invitation to go back to the States. This is a friend of ours who's a theorist as well, and she's like, yeah, but in the States at the moment, you know, we did all of this work critiquing liberal recognition and critiquing the state, right. and now because these hate groups are just so ascendant, everyone's sort of willing to get back in the boat together and just, you know, anything to hold those guys back, right? right? right. So how do you manage to wield the problem of fascism in such a way, right, that you get to also have your critique of liberalism, right, in, in order to work towards this otherwise and the maintenance of the otherwise. Yeah. You know, and here I, I'm going to, how do you, I'm going to take it as plural, how does Cotterbank? Yeah, yeah, oh, okay. totally. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, anyone, I mean, this is... Yeah, yeah, okay, you and the... You, how, does how does one? How one? does one? How does one? How does one? <laughs> um, you know, we were taught, we had a, I, there, the, the fellows that um, are on this nine month research um, gig, I guess it's a gig, uh, are amazing. We had this amazing conversation yesterday. Uh, so I apologize to y'all in advance because I'm just gonna like really paraphrase some of the things we were talking about. Um, but we started the conversation with a question that I think is really important when you think about fascism. Because, of course, we don't, and it came up with Matteo and Rio too. It's like whatever we're referring to when we refer to fascism right now, it can't be the fascisms that were before because we're in a different place. And one of the problems that we, we uh, and I should say we and Cotter being, maybe even we, progressive left, mm. something like that, um, with all everybody's differences, uh, is that the, the right, the alt-right, if we're talking in the US, the, the, the far right, if we're talking in Europe, what we tend to talk about in terms of, to, to describe as this new fascism, um, they've made, the, and the old fashioned to make a claim on the love of country, right? And they do it by purifying the, the we of the country, right? So they find some moment in time and they say, those people are the true we who truly love the country. Right? And everyone else, because they're from somewhere else, et cetera. Now, in the U.S., you, it's, it's completely just mind-boggling U.S. because it's just psychotic. So the way in which white people become the we of that country has to just start evacuating. You're like First you evacuate Native Americans, mm. then you evacuate all the, the span. I mean, there was a great thing, the Hispanic element, you have to evacuate you have to evacuate Afri Africans who came at the same time. You just have to evacuate everybody mm -hmm. to try and get this idea that, you know, these Europeans are the real Americans. Um, you, you see this all also in Australia, right? The, for the Carter being, the, they're trying to say, we love our country. And we are not giving up belonging to our country, right? And that the, the, what they face is this continual displacement, this continual disruption of their relationship to their country. And so we can't just pivot, like, well, the problem is love of country mm -hmm. and attachment to country and, and fighting to be recognized as the real people for their country, right? So how do, you, how do you think about the relationship between what sounds on the surface to be very similar sounding mm. claims? Mm. Um, and the reason I put all this on the table before answering is that, that, uh, that although superficially it, sounds, it can sound similar, what the Cotterbing are claiming is that it's exactly the purifying, hom homogenizing of belonging to country mm. that is at the basis of fascism. Mm. And that it was never the case for them and mm. their parents and grandparents mm. 
that there was just a group with boundaries and it was mm. like everybody out, mm. right? Which is how state recognition mm. of indigenous people try to produce them as. Mm. That is, where's the boundaries of your country? Who was from there? And you just measure like descent. That is, you mm. can just figure it out and say, well, so-and-so made so-and-so like reproduce so-and-so and that's it. And that's a closed system. Mm. And they really insist in the, the collective itself is composed to reflect this, and the films keep showing it, is that they were always obligated to another place, to a set of other places, through language, through ritual, through, you know, if you're on the coast, you have one kind of food, you tr trade it with folks on the other coast, you're married. That doesn't eliminate, that doesn't evacuate that you're from somewhere, but it means that you're always obligated to somewhere else, and that means you're obligated to help them maintain, and that makes a very strong, thick community of places, of a community of not same or different, but same and different, right? And that's the imaginary. How do we, and it, it's, it's absorptive. So when I said at the very beginning, it's really important to hear most, right? There's about, there's, we're most, everybody's, almost everybody is indigenous. Almost everybody is from, but mm. note there's always mm. an opening, mm. an opening that invites someone else to be obligated mm. with you to maintaining something, right? Mm. And that doesn't seem to me to be the form of belonging that fascism is. Mm. The form of belonging that fascism is, is a de-obligating right. of the world that made, like, you know, we, we all know you don't have to go to, where, where are we? And we're in the Netherlands? Where's Brussels? <laughs> Brussels so. in this south of here. Okay. You know, the Congo is in Brussels. Right. It's, it's, it's the material, ma the literal materiality of Brussels. So if you are Congolese, you should say, actually, Brussels belongs to me because it's my material mm. extension that was stolen mm. from me. Mm. And you can never undo that. So there's this right. looping of obligation. Fascism, as it appears in the U.S., as it appears in Europe, as it appeared in Australia, is a attempt to de-obligate. Right. That and can't, that's just, yeah, false. And the yeah. crucial thing, in terms of, sorry, just to go back to the question, yeah, yeah. which is me sorry. going like, oh, wow. The crucial <laughs> thing yeah. is that that form is also the form of liberal mm. multicultural yeah. democracy. Liberal multicultural yeah. democracy when it says... Indigenous people, you're others, and we want to recognize you, but we only recognize one little bloodline of you yeah, going top right. to bottom and nothing else. Everyone else is going to just, you know, starve. And then once you know we I mean? do so it, it's, it's over. It's also right. the modern, you know, we all know this. It's a modern contract. Right. Right? The modern contract is a, is, a, is a social form intended to be able to cut obligation. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Questions from the audience? Okay. <laughs> 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 and Matteo, I'm uh, looking to you to keep time as well. Of don't course. Anything here. Of course. Of course, I said. I should also just say there's there's throughout the films there, and you see it in here. There there's references to to the kinds of obligations they think are mm. are they're not the big event of the kind of fascistic spectacle of right. Um, but there are the little events that, that, that substantially make and remake people in place. So when um, Trevor is saying, you know, I'm taking you to your land so that you can know them and they can know you, but what you see all along is like this, it's a smelling, mm. it's a sweating, it's the drinking, and it's, it's, it's these forms of co-substantiality that obligate you to, to a returning. And well, yeah. it, I mean, my experience, I've seen this film about seven, eight times mm. now, and my experience is that there's a lot of things that I begin to notice after the mm. sixth, seventh viewing that just weren't there at the beginning. Right. Like, there's a moment, I swear I saw it in this screening for the first time ever. There's a moment where Rex, like, turns around over his shoulder and says, oh, that crow there, that's not good. Ah, uh, yeah. And then later okay. in the film, there's a crow calling right. as well. 
And there's also a moment where there's a kid in a white shirt and is lying down and is flicking through Same sand. Time. Yeah. And the point is that the sand has ash in it. The point is that the sand has ash in it. And I have to say, we were going to put a little. Uh, 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 we're we're gonna we're gonna put a little um, dialogue thing in which Trevor says, "Look, signs of ancestors," but then we decided, "Nah," you know, because a lot of it. I mean, it, again, audience is really interesting. What we decide to explain or not right. explain, um, but it's 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 the temporality of viewing is related for them to the tempora to the how you come to belong somewhere. And you don't get to belong somewhere by just being told. Mm. You have to slowly come mm. to understand the signs of a place and what the signs of a place mean. And when he's flicking in that sand, there's no way that if you're amongst us or if you're amongst the, the, the kinds of worlds that um, they're in, that you wouldn't understand that ash it's mm. like oh someone made a fire there right before because when you and it was a little time before because there's not too much sand on top there's just a little sand um but related to the to the crow and that you get that this is all evidence of forms of belonging and him kind of casually probing it yeah Um, please, uh, if people want to have a seat, uh, they can enter. Eh? We Just can't really see very well up here. Yeah. I, I am, I'm just curious um, as to also the means or the strategies to come to that kind of cleaning up, as you were talking about, because I think there's a lot of things going on that we experience here mm. that people are not aware of what it actually does in our perception to this perceived others. Like... Um, the new version of gene, gene therapy, gene, genealogy, which was, right. you, said, I mean, you said fascism is different now to the, uh, right. the, the first fascism. Right. But I, I wonder, maybe, I think it's maybe symptomatically different, but I think there's certain strands that are kind of similar. Right. Do you have that? Can you elaborate on that? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, yeah, I have, um, yeah, the cleaning up. The cleaning up, the, oh, the cleaning up of, yeah, the space. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, first I thought you were talking about the cleaning up of the editing. No, no, I got it, I got it, sorry. <laughs> I'm a little jet lagged. That's why my thermostat keeps on getting cold and hot. Um, yeah, so, you know, one of the, since we're under the, uh, partly at least under the sign of Foucault, one of the, I'll, I'll go around in a circle for a second. One of the, you know, when we get to, well, not when we get to the first, the first of its biopolitical lectures, mm. uh, society must be defended. The 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 you know the the way in which it culminates in his reading of uh, the say the, the the logics of that war. And again, Achille and Bembe is going to reread this, and we can talk about that. But is that these these three different uh, modes of governance, let's say, self and other, uh, 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 just intersetic in a, in a horrific way. So you have the sovereign who's the Fuhrer who says yes or no, who goes in or not. Um, you have the, you have disciplinarity, which is that the, 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 the really almost Fordist Mm. mechanics of the slaughter machine. And then you have biopolitics, which is the cleaning up. Yeah. Um, which again, in, if you're looking at, if you're reading uh, someone like Hannah Arendt, could just be cleaned up. It's just this endless cycle. Of, you just can never get pure enough, right? So it just starts really ramping up and feeding itself. Um, so they're different. I agree with Echo. There are different styles and modalities, but at the heart of it is a certain kind of cleaning up. I think that's right, and and it's 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 a it's a bi it's it's a biologism. Yeah. Um, now this is extraordinarily important. If I think if you're 
say, indigenous in Australia right now, which again, if I, I always feel a little weird sitting here by myself, but if you're in London, please come. Um, but I can talk a bit about this from a legal point of view. So the, the Land Rights Acts, the 1976, and this will get to your question, 1976 there was a um, uh, piece of legislation that was passed, and it was passed as a kind of the announcement to the world, to the nation in the world, that Australia was now multicultural and it had turned its back on its, its racism of the past. That is racism in relation to Asia, racism in relation to its indigenous population, and the act said that, and it was only for the Northern Territory, where there weren't a lot of big cities, so, but let's bracket, we're going to start having to bracket a lot, so let's bracket that first, and, and what it said was, this piece of legislation said, if you're indigenous, you can make a claim for your traditional land as long as, one, it already hadn't been stolen, so it's Commonwealth land. Everything stolen was too bad, too sad. Um, two, that you were, and this by, by law, this is a definition, you're a traditional Aboriginal owner. The subset to being a traditional Aboriginal owner was, A, you had to be a um, member of a local descent group, and B, you had to, uh, uh, wait, local descent group, and you had to, from a dreaming on the land. And then you also had a forged by right, but that was just like, didn't matter. Why does this matter in terms of fascism? Because it's a, it's a minor form of fascism. So the state says to indigenous people who had very complex ways of being obligated to country. One of which was, and people will say it, pick up land through my grandfather, right? That was one. And like I, white Beth, pick up my uh, Italian uh, village in the Alps from my grandfather, which I, I do, but that's only one of the ways, and I also would have to actually be there and know something. I couldn't just go and claim to be from there. That's, that's a link. But it was the only link, which is a way of purifying the, 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 the nation state from its own past, right? Because it, it, it said, Anybody who survives, see you still survive and we recognize you. B, it made it simple to articulate the other to the same. It drew boundaries along land. People were saying, indigenous people were saying, that's not how it works. Like, we didn't have boundaries around our country, right? That's not, that's, no. And they said, yeah, yeah, sure it is. You have boundaries like a little state, and then your little purified, racialized being will be said to be from there. And it makes it Jiminy Cricket great for us because we can easily tell who you are by just looking at you as if you were just animals. And the ethnographers will give us and a diagram. And the ethnographers will give us a diagram. Yeah, right. Um, it's, it's, it's that, I'd say, minor form of fascism. Uh, that is, I would not say it's other than the kind of fascism that we see in the purification fascism of white nationalism. And it's the kind of fascism that Cotterbing is against. And that's why it's almost, mostly, right, recognizing the extraordinary importance of belonging to, but with, that, with the opening of non-fascism that they say was always essential to the way in which they belonged, that the country was open to them, they were open to it, and they were open to each other, right? And it was a, it was a form of loving your traditions and loving your, where you, like you emerge from, but always with the understanding that you were also looped through someone else's, and though you might love yours better, you would never think of telling them how to do their own, and besides, you were obligated in it anyways. And this is, this is, yeah, I think that's, I think you're right, and that cleaning up is, is what Cotterbeing is supposed to. Uh, 
Uh, hi. Um, I'm a bit curious. I'm hoping this is not a too blunt question. Blunt away, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, um, as you already told us a little bit about how you got involved with the grabbing, and yeah. Um, so, how do you feel that your position as, well, as an American white woman within yeah, yeah. Uh, an indigenous collective, how? How do you negotiate that position? And uh, maybe I would love to hear a little bit more about how how that works. Yeah, yeah. that's you know, it's it's very good. It's good to be blunt. Um, so I think I said I mean they, I first went there in 1984 to this little community called Bellion, about 200 250 people, and as a recent BA in philosophy. Um, and again, the, it's, 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 you know, it, it's, I'm going to say something that is no surprise to anybody, but it bears just repeating some things over and over. The world, the infrastructure that moves certain kinds of things through the world and not other kinds of things moved this kind of thing through the world and wound it up at the doorsteps of that community. Now, as a philosopher, but still, the infrastructure moves certain kinds of Bodies, shapes, right. Um, I'm 21, I think. I don't know what I am. Uh, and they, and I'm camping on a beach there, and um, the, her kids, uh, the, the sister of JoJo's mom came down and said, you know what it was it it was part of the this area this peninsula that had been already been alienated so white people it was like a their beach or something and she said who are you and i said oh i'm me and she said oh so you know how to write grants they were you know like like who are you i said yeah yeah i wrote a grant and she said well why don't, if you come and write a grant for us cuz we need someone who write grants for a child cash thing then crash um why don't you just come and so she was my first boss indigenous woman and then she became my first mom and then kinship just unfolds like that um so it's okay. so 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 after a year i mean they did add, they said you know become a we need this thing become this thing and so then i went back and as at, it you know it's it shapes how i think about elizabeth a povinelli elizabeth a povinelli's purpose is to work collectively now for 34 years to not to study it's not i'm not studying them i've never studied them um but for us to to study forms of power that ramify there um and in the meantime do whatever it is that needs to get done if it's land claims that need to get done if it's building out stations that needs to get done whatever needs to get done and then as a theorist theorizing Retheorizing power from its manifestation from there and trying to intervene in the way in which the academy and then politics works there. Um, so we've grown up together. That's one thing. But that we love each other, that we grow up together, that we're family, all of that does not abrogate the fact that we are separated and our destinies are continually made different from the fact that I'm North, white, et cetera, et cetera, and they're not. So, so the practice of making films together or making any project together puts that on the table and it puts that on the table in very blunt material terms. Um, we, we, Cotterbing has what we call open book, which is uh, they know how much money I make, I know how much money they make. We make the films out of my money. Any money we get goes into the bank for them to use to make outstation, make whatever they can. That the collective is, in some ways, it's a it's yeah we wanted, to, it's, but it's a MacGuffin to as a in the sense that it it's a mechanism that that is there to to make the otherwise they want more powerful in their world. So that's why it's always a little weird when I'm alone because mainly, but not always, 
um, we're together. And then sometimes I'm nowhere in sight in Australia. And, um, and then sometimes I'm by myself here. But, but yeah, so that's, it's a very, it's, and it's, it's part of the obligation that, that, that th this is never going to end. It, if they want it to end, it can end any day, right? But, but it's, it, there's, there's, there's just materially an obligation that can't be solved. But it, and the way I put it yesterday and the way I usually put it is it puts the problem on the table to be struggled over. I don't, yeah, that's, yeah. Any other questions? There was one there. And Beth, you uh, already mentioned member, and I would like to return ah, to that. Yeah, yeah. And it's specifically the shift from Foucault's bi biopolitics yeah. to necropolitics, because something else happens there in relation to fascism mm. when we're talking about neoliberal governance through necropolitics. Right. And I wonder whether you have any thought about it. It's something I'm trying to crack, in a way. Well, yeah, it's... I don't know. I'm not going to be... Adequate. There, there are two thoughts I have, and um, one has to do with, uh, it would take your question and put it back into um, a point that Vivian made in the very beginning around experimentation and belatedness. So, uh, I'm, it, for the, again, I'm assuming a lot of y'all know uh, Achille's work and especially his essay, uh, Necropolitics, but what um, Achille did was to say, you're, Foucault, like, I get what you're doing, fine, but the prehistory, the genealogy of biopolitics is not in Europe, it's in, it's in colonial Africa. And we could say it's in the colonial world more globally. And he, he, he meant that very specifically, that is the killing machine, the kind of uh, cleaning up, racializing, killing machine occurred first in colonial Africa. And we don't have to say first, and it could also be in the Americas, right? So it's in a lot of places. And here, once again, we see the way in which there's an experimentation in, in, in the poor, the brown, the colonized world that then circulates back into Europe. So, so similar to, say, how you experiment with jailing poor brown people for poverty, it will circulate back into white people. Mm. Yeah. But they're going to experiment first elsewhere. So, so it's the, so you, you rethink fascism, what Achille is saying, we have to, we have to show the roots of fascism in, in the viciousness of it in, in, in a racialized politics that predates Europe and thus and it distends it into a global network that I think is really important that we need to, like fascism Really, Europe looks different. Where is Europe, right? Where is Europe's exceptionalism? So I think that's really important. Um, if you're sitting in, uh, in indigenous lands in America, in the Americas, in the Pacific, in Australia, you, 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 you see something similar to... Achille's necropolitics. So one, one of the things that Achille was saying is like, look, this was being practiced openly way before Hitler mm. in the colonies, mm. right? This wasn't secret. This wasn't in machines. This was just openly being experimented on, mm. right? It was an open technology. And what we, what we see that's, that, that's practiced openly in places like Australia is what I've called geontology or geontopower, not bio or necropower, and that is the the forms of killing that can happen, the forms of discipline and sovereignty that can happen 
around not life and death, but life and non-life, those people who refuse to say that soil, rock, river, sand, water, shore, air is not inert, the inert other over which humans rule, right? And then certain people, and then you purify, you like, you know, but rather part and parcel of a system of obligated relations. Mm. And that's a kind of fascism of, a, of, a, of another sort that, um, again, caught up being, um, but a, a number of people want to think about what kind of, what kind of killing, what kind of uh, sovereignty is exposed when, you, when you're in a world in which, you know, that Christian sovereignty over soil... Um, the, 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 the fascism of, of the human um, is, ex, is exposed. Mm. And I, 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 that's, that, that's also in our fascism, that it's, it's the cleaning up of, the, of humans, but it's also that a form of the human that, that seeks to rule by contract over, mm. right? And, and that is a form that's, that's, that's annihilating. Mm. And it's annihilating much, but of course, if you're poor and brown and indigenous and you're, you know it's gonna, it's gonna ramify on you first. Mm. It's gonna, it is already ram, it has been ramifying on you. That's what Ashil is saying, it has been ramifying. This is not something that happened in 1940s. It happened in mm. 17, 14 hundreds, 16 hundreds, 18 hundreds, mm. right? You're just late to your own party. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. So the, yeah. The, what you guys study is a set of European liberal analytics or yeah. techno like technologies of thought and habit playing out at the limits of their possibility. Yeah. And therefore, it's possible to see that perhaps fascism, bracket, as the violence, the exclusive violence of modernity, is a kinship problem. Yeah. It's yeah. a problem of family. It's a problem of who gets, what is proper kinship in terms of family, but then what in terms family? of things other than human stuff. That's right. It's also, a you know, there's a lot of... People in this room who know that the lives you're leading are like a time machine for others. Mm. And, and it's like, you want to see your future? Here it is, because you've already done it to us. Um, and so that the anger, I mean, one of the things I love about, you know, my colleagues, and there's also so much humor. There's also, you know, in the humor and anger, oh, two sides of the coin, because there's also a like, I can't wait for your future to come back to you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then you laugh, but but there is a you know to take like are there, is there an otherwise? There's not an otherwise in the future. There's an otherwise right here. That that people re refuse to take, um, and and okay. having having a white person in the collective is a good thing because you can just pull out and say, okay, you're, you're Jack the Racist because it's already, in the, it's already in the group, right? It's already in the group. That is, you can't purify out. Yeah. Oh. I have a question regarding the experiment, the laboratory of fascism, hmm. and you're addressing this as a conscious process, ah. and right. as fascism right. has been defined also before as a non-ideology, is it not more the, the success of fascism that when these experiments take place that they are capable of materializing and... Um, like Financializing or capitalizing on this neo, right. uh, on the capitalist fascist experiments that happened in the colonies, that happened in the outskirts, and once that has been like evolutionarily successful, then it's being brought back to the right. fascist indigenous right. population. 
Right. Um, I'm going to answer, but I might. But c if I'm not answering, like pull, push, ba push back again, because I think I understand the question you're asking, but I'm not positive. Um, I will start by saying uh, what all the f that there's a film of ours in the um, screening room called Nighttime Go, and it's it's based on. It, something that happened, um, which is in World War II, uh, that the you know the high water, water point for certain forms of fascism. Um, uh, the parents or grandparents of the adults in Katabing were forcibly interned in war camps. They were taken off their country and they were put into war camps. And they were bad places because you know they're, everybody from all over the place was just forced in there, there was overcrowding, it was just, you know, it was, uh, it was bad. And um, Jojo's mom was just a child and her parents and her parents' brothers ran away from the war camp. And it's one of these great stories. They ran, ran away and they walked like 300 plus kilometers through the bush back to their country. And the film starts that way, but then it, it switches and it becomes kind of alt past in which that, that escape uh, uh, generates a general uh, revolt against settlers and indigenous people push all the white people out of the Northern Territory and, until you're back in September 2017 and indigenous kids don't even know what a white person is. So it kind of, it's like this. So, so it, uh, the reason I bring it up because that, that film, it, it's, I, we, we all love it. It's a really fun film, but it's also the most um, kind of joyous in terms mm. of it's like it's deep, it's funny, but then at the end it's like there's a general insurrection and we win, right? The rest of the films, and Wu thought is really very much in this genre, there's, there's no, it's like a, the propositions, there's no real resolution because members' lives don't resolve and instead um, what the films do is they, they, I think, they show both all the, you know, the ancestors are punishing you because you can't get there often enough because you're poor. You try and get there and the state punishes you because the only way of getting there is to act illegally, right? And then, you know, and so it's just this, this set of forces that in which you're going to be punished one way or the other, and yet you keep doing it because you you have to. You're obligated to do it. Um, so the films don't say there is a exit other than persistence and stubbornness. And indeed, the otherwise uh, is is if you're really in the otherwise versus the other, that can be commodified, capitalized, experimented on them, then when we get it down, what the contractual form will be or the commodity form or the imprisonment mm -hmm. form or whatever mm -hmm. it is, the purified form. We experiment here until we got it and then we bring it over here. At least what these films are saying is that, and what the Cotterbing are saying and what their life is saying is that, no, what what the otherwise is is just this this the the affect of the of the otherwise is what's it, what's really at stake which is fuck it we're doing it anyways we're going to keep going punished 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 and we get to the ancestors and they're just saying keep keep doing it right now is that is that stubbornness commodifiable well hey, i suppose anything is commodifiable but then we have to say, we have to think about the where in which we're talking about. And in, the, in these spaces of experimentation, that kind of stubbornness is not, I think, commodified or simply absorbable into because it mm -hmm. doesn't have a simple kind of, well, if you gave us the money, we'd be fine. If you gave us the land, we'd be fine. Mm. If you gave us... If you gave us, just la let us be white, we'd be fine, right? Because it's saying it's all these forces are the 
otherwise to what we say we want. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, it's, it's, it's not an answer, it's more of a, it's, it's an affect. It's a, it's a Deleuzian affect, I mean, but I, it's not a Deleuzian affect. I, I'll give you a, there's liberalism, um, can I answer one more thing? Oh, okay, then never mind. <laughs> I can I can see that uh, that Mateo's ah, hovering. I don't have, a, um, I have time. And yeah. uh, but I wanted to uh, quickly before the the notes for for the break. Uh, of course, there will be the new film, and so Beth just explained the the forms of the film. The new one will be uh, uh, premiering uh, ah. at the Tate in London on uh, the twenty seventh and twenty eighth of October. Twenty eighth, twenty ninth. Twenty eighth, twenty ninth of October, and then. Uh, the fourth edition of Frontier Imaginaries will be here in the Netherlands uh, next April 7th, right. which yep. will have a large new commission, also right. by uh, Kadabing Film Collective, and particularly engaging with a really remarkable museum in Brabant, which is a museum of falconry and cigar mm -hmm. history. Okay. So that's that uh, two opportunities to see the ongoingness of this ongoing practice. Right on. Thank you, guys. <laughs> so thanks so much. Thanks so much to uh, Elizabeth and Vivian. And please stick around because now we have the first round of video clips.